Do that. Do you hear me? Yeah, stop all departures. Okay. Stop all. Yeah, I went in the Pentagon. ISIL's ability to carry out terrorist attacks in Syria, Iraq, and abroad has not to date been significantly diminished, and the tempo of ISIL-linked terrorist activity is a reminder of the group's continued global reach. Uh, gentlemen, you have a very difficult task trying to defend our homeland, trying to keep Americans safe. But I, in, in, in reading this, I just want to make the point that it's been two years since President Obama laid out our goal, America's goal toward ISIL, which was defeated. Two years. It took us about four years to defeat Nazi Germany. And the like. This makes for a more complicated and challenging homeland security, public safety environment. I think I speak for all three of us when I say that the prospect of the next terrorist-inspired attack on our homeland is the thing that keeps us up at night most often. Engine 108, we have a report of a plane crash somewhere in the area of the Pentagon. We're trying to... An effective deterrence policy. Therefore, if a decision is prematurely made to separate NSA and Cyber Command, I will object to the confirmation of any individual nominated by the President to replace the director of the National Security Agency if that person is not also nominated to be the commander of Cyber Command. This committee and this chairman are tired of the way that Congress in general and this committee is treated by this administration. Okay. No more. That is a very important way in which we're transformed, and it's a testament to the quality of people doing this work. I'm proud to be able to represent them. And so I appreciate your support of the FBI in our work, and I look forward to your questions. In a series of hearings on Koskinen's response to congressional subpoenas for emails from the agency. This is about three and a half hours. Good morning. The Judiciary Committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on the impeachment articles referred on John Koskinen, Part 3, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. The Constitution sets forth a system of checks and balances which grants each branch of government tools to help ensure that no one branch of government attains too much power. The legislative branch's tools include the power to write the laws, the power of the purse, the impeachment power, the power to censure, among others. These tools empower Congress to exert oversight over the executive and judicial branches, including rooting out corruption, fraud, and abuse by government officials, and taking further disciplinary action on behalf of the American people when warranted. The duty to serve as a check on the other branches, including against corruption and abuse, is a solemn one, and Congress does not and must not take this responsibility lightly. That is why this committee has scheduled this hearing today. In 2013, the American people first learned that their own government had been singling out conservative groups for heightened review by the IRS as they applied for tax-exempt status. This IRS targeting scandal was nothing short of shocking. It was a political plan to silence the voices of groups representing millions of Americans Conservative groups across the nation were impacted by this targeting, resulting in lengthy paperwork requirements, overly burdensome information requests, and long, unwanted delays in their applications. In the wake of this scandal, then-IRS official Lois Lerner stepped down from her position, but questions remain about the scope of the abuses by the IRS. The allegations of misconduct against Mr. Koskinen are serious and include the following. On his watch, volumes of information crucial to the investigation into the IRS targeting scandal were destroyed. Before the tapes were destroyed, congressional demands, including subpoenas for information about the IRS targeting scandal, went unanswered and were not complied with. Mr. Koskinen provided misleading testimony before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee concerning IRS efforts to provide information to Congress. These are very serious allegations of misconduct, and this committee has taken these allegations seriously. Over the past several months, this committee has meticulously poured through thousands of pages of information produced by the investigation into this matter. 
On May 24, this committee held a hearing at which the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee formally presented its findings and evidence to the members of this committee. Then on June 22, this committee held a second hearing to allow outside experts to assess and comment on the evidence presented to the committee at its May 24, 2016 hearing and the options for a congressional response. Today we hold a third hearing and hear from Mr. Koskinen himself. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Koskinen today. It's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. Uh, members, uh, and I want to thank first Commissioner Koskinen for joining us today on short notice and under these unusual circumstances. Last week, a handful of my colleagues attempted to force a vote on your impeachment, and when it appeared that they would fall short of the necessary votes, that effort was abandoned, and this hearing was scheduled instead. I hope that my colleagues now see what I see when I look back at the history of impeachment in the House of Representatives, which we all uh, have an obligation to do. No matter how we feel about a particular official, no matter what we think of his or her agency, successful impeachments are bipartisan efforts and partisan attacks cloaked in the impeachment process are doomed from the start. Mr. Chairman, the effort to impeach Commissioner Koskinen is destined to fail on both the merits and as a matter of process. And if they somehow force this measure to the floor again, I fear it will set a terrible precedent. On the merits, the commissioner's critics simply have not proved their case. In fact, every other investigation to have examined these facts have refuted the charges against Commissioner Koskinen. The Senate Finance Committee, in a report that serves as the only bipartisan account of the matter, found no evidence that the commissioner had intent to mislead Congress at any time. The Department of Justice found, and I quote, found no evidence that any IRS official acted based on political, discriminatory, corrupt, or other inappropriate motives, in quotation. And, quote again, no evidence that any official attempted to obstruct justice, in quotation. The Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, again, found no evidence to show that IRS employees had been directed to destroy or hide information from Congress. Despite these findings, some members continue to insist that the commissioner ordered, quote, or ordered 24,000 emails erased before Congress could review them, in quotation marks. Citing zero evidence to back the claim, independent fact checkers rated this statement as categorically false. There's simply no evidence that the commissioner has acted with intentional bad faith in his leadership of the Internal Revenue Service. But even if there were some evidence of wrongdoing, the push to impeach the commissioner on the House floor without even basic due process in the committee is wildly misguided. According to parliamentarians of the House past and present, the impeachment process does not begin until the House actually votes to authorize this committee to investigate the charges. In other words, this is not an impeachment hearing. Merely including the word impeachment in the title doesn't do the job at all. 
And at an actual impeachment hearing, the commissioner would be represented by counsel and he'd have the right to present evidence, the right to question the evidence presented against him. In this case, by contrast, the commissioner has been denied access to the transcripts of interviews conducted by the House Oversight Committee. Even though we are told that those transcripts were key in forming the charges against him. Many members of this committee are in the same position, I might add. I'm not alone in being skeptical of short process or in noting the importance of a full and independent investigation by this committee. In 2006, Mr. Sensenbrenner, the gentleman from Wisconsin, argued, and I quote, only after the House Judiciary Committee has conducted a fair, thorough, and detailed investigation will committee members be able to consider whether articles of impeachment by, might be warranted, end quotation. In 2010, Mr. Chairman, you expressed confidence in our impeachment task force because it had conducted an exhaustive investigation. That investigation included, in your words, quote, reviewing the records of past proceedings, rooting out new evidence that was never considered in previous investigations, conducting numerous interviews and depositions with first-hand witnesses, and conducting hearings to take the testimony of first-hand witnesses and scholars, in quotation marks. All of that process is missing here. Yes, we have it within our power to skip these steps, but what kind of precedence does that set? Never in the history of this body have we impeached a government official without first proving that he has acted in deliberate bad faith. Never in modern practice have we declined to provide the accused with the most basic due process, the right to counsel, the right to present evidence, and the right to question the evidence against him. If the commissioner's critics have their way, I fear we will have a new rule going forward. The House may impeach any government official for any reason, without supplying evidence of deliberate wrongdoing, without an invest independent investigation, and without base regard to basic fairness towards the accused. Forcing a vote in this manner will certainly not result in the removal of the commissioner. Even if his critics succeed here, senators of both parties have already stated their intent to bury the matter. And in the process, I fear, we will have stripped our responsibilities of their weight and dignity and turned impeachment from a constitutional check of last resort into a tool of political convenience. And I cannot accept that and none of us should. Commissioner Koskinen, thank you again for your willingness to be here today. Stick to the law and the facts and you'll be fine. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We welcome our distinguished witness, and Commissioner, if you would please rise, I'll begin by swearing you in. Do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative. <clears throat> Commissioner John Koskinen was sworn in as the 48th IRS Commissioner on December 23, 2013. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Koskinen served as the non-executive chairman of Freddie Mac from 2008 to 2012, acting chief executive officer in 2009. Previously, Mr. Koskinen... 
Previously, Mr. Koskinen served as president of the U.S. Soccer Foundation, deputy mayor and city administrator of Washington, D.C., assistant to the president and chair of the president's council on year 2000 conversion, and deputy director of the office for the management at the Office of Management and Budget. He holds a law degree from Yale University of Law and a bachelor's degree from Duke University. Mr. Koskinen, you are welcome. Your entire testimony will be made a part of the record, and we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Your written statement, uh, as I said, will be made a part of the record, and you see a timing light on the table. Please uh, help us. We have a lot of members with a lot of questions to ask. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Conyers, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to answer questions here today. I understand the extraordinary responsibilities entrusted to this committee. I appreciate both your willingness to hear from me and the serious and fair-minded approach you have taken on the discharge. I'll do my best today to answer your questions, and I'm committed to full cooperation. I recognize the obligation all public service share, servants share to be responsive to Congress to the best of our abilities. That means listening and responding to feedback and criticism, acknowledging mistakes, and working diligently to improve. Let me note at the outset how much I deeply regret our inability to bring the C-4 issue to a close in a way that satisfies all Americans and members of Congress. I understand the level of suspicion and distrust caused by the IRS's failure to properly handle applications for social welfare status based solely on the names of the organization. I took this job in large part to help restore confidence in the IRS and to ensure that the agency never returned to the unacceptable practices that had occurred before I arrived. I believe we've made real progress during my tenure in ending the practices that gave risk to rise to the concerns, addressing operational weaknesses, creating a culture of risk management, and working to reassure taxpayers that our tax system treats taxpayers fairly. The tax system only works if taxpayers are confident that the IRS will treat them fairly and that it doesn't make any difference who they are, what organization or political party they belong to, or whom they voted for in the last election. This is an important principle to us at the IRS, and no one in addition should have to wait years for an answer to a question or a request for a determination of any kind. Congress also has a right to expect that reforms to restore the public's trust in a nonpartisan and effective IRS will be implemented fully. I've devoted my energies as commissioner to that goal, and the inspector general has acknowledged that real progress has been made in implementing all of his recommendations. For instance, the IRS eliminated long ago the use of the Beyond the Lookout, or BOLO lists as they're known, that had resulted in the improper scrutiny of a number of applicants as described in TIGDA's May 2013 report. The IRS has also offered an expedited approval process for organizations that experience delays in the processing of their applications for 501c4 status. Continuing our efforts to restore public confidence in the IRS will remain my top priority every day that I'm fortunate enough to continue to serve. I also un <clears throat> understand there are significant remaining questions on the minds of some members about the IRS response to congressional inquiries on my watch. I stand ready to answer these questions today. I responded honestly and in good faith as events unfolded, particularly in response to the discovery that Lois Lerner's hard drive had crashed in 2011. From the start, I directed IRS staff to cooperate fully with Congress and to recover lost information wherever possible, and I testified to the best of my knowledge. But the truth is, we did not succeed in preserving all of the information requested and some of my testimony later proved mistaken. I regret both of those failings. I can also tell you that, with the benefit of hindsight, even closer communication with Congress would have been advisable. But my commitment is and always has been to tell you and all committees of the Congress the truth and to address issues head on. 
I accept that it is up to you to judge my overall record, but I believe that imp <clears throat> impeachment would be improper, it would create disincentives for many good people to serve, and it would slow the pace of reform and progress at the IRS. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by recognizing myself. The report of investigation by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, or TIGTA, concludes in its 2015 report regarding congressional requests for emails that, and I quote, the investigation revealed that the IRS did not put forth an effort to uncover additional responsive emails. None of the IRS employees involved had been asked prior to the June 30, 2014 request from TIGTA to find any backup tapes or the server hard drives associated with the NCFB Exchange 2003 server, which would have contained responsive learner emails. The investigation determined that if the IRS would have conducted a search for the existence of backup tapes, they would have found the necessary backup tapes that contained learners' missing emails prior to when those tapes were degaussed in March 2014, unquote. Mr. Koskinen, is there anything inaccurate in that finding of the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration? And if so, what is inaccurate from it, about it? No, it's nothing inaccurate in that. Uh, the, uh, I'd be happy to explain to you my understanding of how that happened, but the report is accurate. Do you believe that it was the duty of the IRS Commissioner to, as the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration stated, put forth an effort to uncover additional responsive emails to Congress's inquiries? Yes or no? Yes. The report of investigation by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration also concluded in its 2015 report as follows, and I quote, the investigation revealed that the backup tapes were destroyed as a result of IRS management failing to ensure that a May 22, 2013 email directive from IRS Chief Technology Officer concerning the preservation of electronic email media was fully understood and followed by all of the IRS employees responsible for handling and disposing of email backup media. Is there anything inaccurate in that finding of the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration? No. <clears throat> Do you believe that it was the duty of the IRS Commissioner to, as the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration stated, to ensure that a May 22, 2013 email directive from IRS Technology Officer concerning the preservation of electronic email media was fully understood and followed by all of the IRS employees responsible for handling and disposing of email backup media. And I'd appreciate a yes or no response to that. <clears throat> uh, yes, to the extent the IRS commissioner has control over that. Uh, the official IRS website in its section describing uh, you, Commissioner John Koskinen, states, Mr. Koskinen manages an agency of about 90,000 employees and a budget of approximately $10.9 billion. You are the top manager at the IRS. So when the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration concluded that the IRS did not put forth an effort to uncover additional responsive emails and that the backup tapes were destroyed as a result of IRS management failing, the Inspector General was referring to you the manager of the IRS. Is that correct? As the leader of the organization, I am responsible for the management of it. There are a lot of managers there, but ultimately uh, any CEO, any director of the organization is responsible for its operations. So after you received the congressional subpoena, which uh, affirmatively required that uh, you uh, protect uh, all uh, uh, emails related to this subject, what affirmative steps did you take personally to ensure all responsive documents were preserved? <clears throat> I uh, met with senior executives and was assured that an appropriate uh, document retention order had been put out the prior year. Uh, the woman asking, ask, acting as my counsel at the time sent a follow-up memo in February to the IT department to remind them and, uh, that they ensure uh, that all of the available information be pre preserved, and I was assured that that was being done. Did you uh, send anyone to different locations where uh, uh, emails are degaussed or destroyed, if you will, uh, and instruct them not to destroy 
any emails without first going through the persons responsible for uh, your responsibility to respond to this subpoena and say make sure that no emails are destroyed uh, without first verifying that uh, they're not related to this congressional subpoena. I did not personally do that. I was assured that you know, managers understood uh, the impact of the document retention uh, request or order in uh, 2013 before I arrived and the follow-up in February, 14, uh, February 2014, I was assured, would make it clear uh, to employees and managers everywhere to preserve documents. We were at that point eight months into a massive document search, so it did not, uh, uh, it seemed to me everybody would understand the goal and the instruction to people was to produce all of the information as quickly as we could wherever it was. But apparently that message didn't get to the people who actually do the work of destroying uh, emails. It apparently got to everyone but two employees on the midnight shift in Martinsburg. And I, at the time that was revealed, which was a year after uh, uh, the hearings in 2014, I said that that was a mistake, it shouldn't have happened, and I took responsibility for it. My time's expired. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for his <laughs> questions. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte, and uh, welcome again to the committee, sir. Yesterday, the chairman and I received a letter from our colleagues uh, and uh, some 32 signatures, and I ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this letter be made a part of the record. Without objection, it will be made a part of the record. Commissioner Koskinen, this letter cites the example of one of our colleagues who claims the head of the IRS ordered 24,000 emails erased before Congress could review them, in quotation. Commissioner, did you order the destruction of 24,000 emails in an attempt to obstruct congressional investigators? I did not. Of course you didn't. According to PolitiFact, there is no zero evidence to support this claim. The letter also cites to an exchange of letters which J. Russell George, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask that this letter be made a part of the record as well. Without objection, it will be made a part Thank of Thank you. In 2015, the Inspector General released a report that concluded no evidence was uncovered that any IRS employees had been directed to destroy or hide information from the Congress. This same conclusion was independently reached by the Senate Finance Committee and the Department of Justice. Last week, my colleague wrote to the Inspector General to ask him if he had obtained any evidence whatsoever over the past year to cause his office to change its conclusion. He responded within a day, and the answer was no. Commissioner Koskinen, to your knowledge, have any of the underlying facts changed since the Senate Finance Committee the Department of Justice and the Treasury Inspector General concluded that there is no evidence of your intent to mislead Congress or obstruct the investigation. <clears throat> no. I spoke earlier about the precedent of the House, which has always provided some basic due process to an accused official. For example, in 2010, we allowed Judge Porteous to submit evidence, call witness, and cross-examine others. In 1996, we allowed counsel for President Clinton to do the same. In 1874, this committee allowed Secretary of War William Belknap the opportunity to explain, present witnesses, and cross-examine witnesses. But here, in 2016, I understand that you have not been allowed to review 
the evidence against you. The Oversight Committee conducted over 50 transcribed interviews and claims that those interviews were key to forming the charges against you. Mr. Commissioner, have you asked to review these transcripts? Uh, we have. Have you been given an opportunity to review them? No. Do you believe they might include evidence that clears you of any of these charges? I do. If there were any evidence there that I'd actually <clears throat> indicated or told anyone to impede the op operations of the Congress, destroy or mislead the Congress, I assume someone would have already quoted it. So I assume that those 50 depositions would support the fact that I did nothing to impede the operation of the Congress. I gave no instructions to anyone to do anything other than fully cooperate with the requests of the Congress. I thank you, sir, for your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Sure, thanks, gentlemen, and recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this administration seems to have set a record for the number of agency heads who have wrongly deleted work-related emails, the number of federal employees who have pled the Fifth Amendment to avoid incriminating themselves, and the number of officials who have failed to respond to lawfully served subpoenas. Even in this deplorable company, one agency stands out. The Internal Revenue Service targeted organizations solely on the basis of their conservative views. We expect this kind of behavior from dictatorships and totalitarian governments, not from the United States of America government. It represents a direct attack on freedom of religion, excuse me, it represents a direct attack on freedom of speech and thus an attack on our Constitution and our democracy. That this corruption of power continued unrestrained for several years can only lead to one conclusion. Such conduct is an abuse of office that was condoned by the administration and warrants stiff penalties. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Ohio, Jim Jordan. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Koskinen, I'm going to read from the Articles of Impeachment, page 2. It says, on March 4, 2014, the Internal Revenue Service magnetically erased 422 backup tapes. Is that statement true? Yes. Were you commissioner at the time that these tapes were erased? Yes. Was there a subpoena in place for the very information that was erased? Yes. More than one subpoena, right? There were two subpoenas. Uh, well, the subpoenas asked for specific information. The assumption is that some of that information was on those tapes. Not the assumption. It was on those tapes uh, because it was from the critical time period when uh, Ms. Lerner's hard drive had crashed. Mr. Koskin, who's Kate Duvall? Pardon? Who's Kate Duvall? Kate Duvall was serving as, <coughs> excuse me, counselor to the commissioner. When we got her bio, it said, counselor to the commissioner, it said she advised on high-profile investigations and she was a member of your senior management team. Is that accurate? Yes. In her deposition in front of the Oversight Committee, Ms. Duvall said she learned on February 2nd, 2014, about Lois Lerner's computer crash and missing emails. So on February 2nd, the counselor to the commissioner in senior management, working on high-profile investigations, learns evidence is missing. And one month later, March 4th, the backup tapes that contain this evidence are destroyed. What a coincidence, Mr. Koskinen. One month after your top counselor learns Miss Lerner's hard drive is crashed and there are missing emails, the backup tapes, the secondary source, the primary source is gone. And a month later, the backup tapes are destroyed. Now, here's what's also interesting. Those backup tapes were supposed to have been destroyed months and months beforehand, weren't they, Mr. Koskinen? Yes, and a large number of them had been destroyed in 2012 and 13. In fact, you testified to this. You said this. Ms. Lerner, this is a testimony in front of the Oversight Committee. You said Ms. Lerner's hard drive had crashed in June 2011. As a result, certain emails could not be retrieved. Recovery tapes containing data for that period no longer existed. False statement. They did, but they were supposed to have been erased. This data was retained on tapes for only six months. So they were supposed to have been erased actually two years prior to the date that they were, but they somehow survived. They somehow survived, and then exactly one month, 30 days after your top counselor, Kate Duvall, in senior management, learns that the primary source, the emails are missing, these backup tapes that have survived for two years suddenly get destroyed. And we're supposed to believe that's just a coincidence? 
that just happened by chance? The Inspector General spent a year looking into exactly that subject and came up with the conclusion after interviewing over 50 witnesses that that was totally a mistake by two employees on the midnight shift in Martinsburg. The no old, the old, no one, the old midnight shift guys in Martinsburg excuse. Well, okay. That's okay. the IG's report after a year. Okay. Well, let me read one other statement to you again from the Articles of Impeachment. This is on page 3, Article 2. On June 20th, 2014, Commissioner Koskinen testified, quote, since the start of this investigation, every email has been preserved, nothing has been lost, nothing has been destroyed. Is that statement true, Mr. Koskinen? At the time, that was what I had been informed, what I believed. A year later or whoa, whoa, nine whoa, whoa, months. Whoa, it, it, that was, it, 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 could was, have been, it could not have been true at the time because not, it, that it, says it, the date <clears throat> is June 20th, 2014. Uh, that's and correct. you just told me on March 4th, the first question I ask you, on March 4th, three months before that, March 4th, 2014, that the IRS had destroyed 422 backup tapes. That's correct. So, so how is this statement true that you made under oath to a congressional committee? Uh, <clears throat> the statement was not correct in light of that evidence, which I did so not know. So the statement wasn't true? Uh, <clears throat> the statement I thought was true. It was not true on the basis of the evidence that uh, we discovered later. Mr. Chairman, this is the problem. You think about any, any of the folks we represent, any of the constituents I represent in the 4th District of Ohio has this same fact pattern where they lose documents and then a month later, they're, they're being audited by the IRS, they lose documents, a month later they destroy the backup disk and it's fine, they, they can get away with that. There is, this, is the, this is what so many Americans are frustrated about, this double standard. Mr. Koskinen can lose documents, excuse me, the IRS can lose documents, then destroy the backup source, the backup tapes, and nothing happens. Any American that happens to them, they're in big trouble, and everybody knows it. We're not asking to, all we're asking is this guy no longer hold this office. That's all we're asking, and in light of this fact pattern, I think that's the least we can do. I yield back. I'm with a gentleman from Texas has expired. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your opening statement, you mentioned reviewing thousands of pages of documents related to these charges. Does the committee majority have access to the unedited uh, transcripts of interviews conducted by the Oversight Committee? <laughs> okay. You should direct your questions to the witness. I'm directing my question to the chairman. <laughs> parliamentary inquiry. And please stop the clock. It's a parliamentary inquiry. We do not think so. You do not think that the majority has access? No. It, well, I would request that the minority, at least, if the majority wishes, that's your prerogative, that I would request the minority have access to these documents. The, the uh, chair will take your request under advisement as we ascertain whether or not your question is answered in the affirmative. If so, then we obviously think it should be. Well, we're going forward with impeachment. Uh, hearings uh, that are the purview of this committee, I think this committee ought to see uh, all the relevant evidence. Um, but that's, that's self-evident. Um, let me just say, before I ask Mr. Kiskinen some questions, that uh, Mr. Jordan's questions, wasn't this true then? Yes. Did you know it was true then? No. Did you tell the truth then as you knew it? Yes. That fact pattern shows nothing about impeachment, obviously. All it shows is that he didn't know at the time he was asked the question. He told the truth as he then knew it. Mr. Kiskinen, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here. The Senate Finance Committee, the Department of Justice, and the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration have all in looked into the accusations against you, and each of them has independently concluded there is no evidence to support these charges. Your critics have not made their case, nor do they have the votes to force impeachment on the House floor, and these proceedings are an obvious sham. But because uh, you are an expert on tax policy, I do think it, it serves some purpose to shed some light on how you as the IRS commissioner understand some of the work of the IRS. If someone, uh, is there anything that would prohibit someone from releasing their tax returns if they want to because they're under audit? No. Thank you. Now, President Nixon discloses tax returns while under aud IRS audit. Have the rules changed since then? No. Can an individual use other people's money, run through a charitable foundation to enrich himself or satisfy his personal debts or obligations? Uh, <clears throat> the rules are that would be personal inurement. Uh, no tax-exempt organization can benefit, uh, use its funds to benefit any, uh, uh, in, in effect, insider. Would the following factors uh, 
affect the, the tax exemption of a foundation. If an individual used funds from his charitable foundation to pub, pu purchase a $12,000 football helmet for himself, signed by Tim Tebow, if an individual used $20,000 from the foundation to pay for a six-foot-tall portrait by himse of himself, if an individual used $100,000 of the foundation's money to cover part of a legal settlement after a dispute with the municipal government, or if he used $158,000 to settle a dispute with a disgruntled participant at a celebrity golf tournament, were any of those actions using tax-exempt foundation monies improper, and if so, would they jeopardize the tax, the tax exemption of the foundation? I can't comment on individual I'd like to answer the question, sir. Uh, I object to the question in that it's outside the scope of this hearing. Uh, additionally, it's outside the scope and expertise of the witness. Uh, That's the, not a proper parliamentary inquiry. The rules of the committee would permit the gentleman to ask the question, and the commissioner is requested to answer it. Uh, uh, I, <clears throat> clearly, the general rules are understood that uh, the, a uh, uh, 501c's asset should not be used to benefit uh, either a major contributor or anyone uh, operating the entity. The particular facts and circumstances of any case would need to be reviewed carefully uh, and accurately. Obviously, but if those were the facts that I just said, would they be improper? Uh, all I can tell you is that the rules are clear and it would be uh, up to um, a, a set of people who do this regularly at the IRS to investigate and make a determination as to whether, in fact, the tax exemption of that organization uh, was you. still viable. Uh, Commissioner, in your opinion, if a pa fact pattern like this one were brought to the attention of the IRS and the IRS failed to investigate it, would that be a dereliction of duty or even an impeachable offense? The commissioner does not make a determination as to about any audit or investigation. We get referrals, suggestions, uh, sometimes might uh, review uh, urgings to look into a wide range of activities of uh, not only tax-exempt organizations but others. Those are referred to a okay. detailed process internally, and Thank it's you. not my role to make that Thank you. I have one last question, and that is, at the time you were appointed by the president, why did he ask you to, take, to come out of retirement and uh, appoint you to the head of the IRS. What, what, mission, what, did, he take, what, what mission did he give you? Uh, actually, I did not talk to the President personally. Uh, I talked to uh, <coughs> Secretary Liu, who I knew from years ago, and White House personnel. Uh, and the reason I was asked was obvious. The IRS had made a terrible management mistake. I've spent 45 years of my career managing organizations <laughs> under stress, uh, including in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, and it was obvious to me, just reading the paper, that there was a problem that needed to be fixed, and I was uh, honored to be asked and pleased to undertake the responsibility. Thank you very much. My time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, everybody's afraid of the IRS, and no wonder. They can make your life a living hell if they want to. That's why it's so important that they play it straight that they don't play favorites, that they don't play politics. Well, back in the years leading up to Barack Obama's reelection in 2012, the IRS did play politics. It intensely scrutinized conservative organizations, especially if they had the words T and party in their title, and all but refused to grant them tax-exempt status. At the same time, the IRS freely granted such status to liberal organizations. Why would they do this? to give Barack Obama and his liberal allies the advantage in the upcoming election. And who ordered it? Well, Lois Lerner was the head of the exempt organizations unit of the IRS. She ordered it. But who above her told her to do it? And did it go all the way to the White House? We'll never know. Because she destroyed the evidence. Then took the fifth, and then the Obama Justice Department refused to prosecute her and find out the answers to these important questions. In many ways, this is a lot like what Hillary Clinton did. She destroyed the evidence. Evidence of her emails was sought by the FBI and by congressional committees. Rather than comply, she had her emails destroyed, and she lied about it. She even had the devices that stored the emails, multiple Blackberries and iPads, destroyed, some with a hammer. Yet the Obama administration, Justice Department, refused to prosecute her, too. So, Mr. Commissioner, where do you come in? Well, when the selective targeting of conservative groups by the IRS story 
broke, President Obama feigned outrage, said that targeting was inexcusable, and declared that we needed, quote, new leadership that can help restore confidence going forward, unquote. So President Obama brought you in uh, to head the IRS, supposedly to clean up the mess. Arguably, Commissioner Koskinen, you made matters worse. How? Well, you testified before congressional committees on multiple occasions. You made a number of important statements before Congress, which turned out to be completely false, even though you were under oath. For example, in referring to Lois Lerner's emails, you stated, quote, uh, since uh, the start of this investigation, every email has been preserved. Nothing has been lost. Nothing has been destroyed, unquote. This turned out to be completely untrue, of course. Lerner had tens of thousands of emails destroyed, and when you learned of this, rather than inform Congress, you failed to notify Congress for four months. Why in the world did you wait four months? Uh, actually, I waited two months. I was advised of this uh, situation in April, and the reason I waited, because I instructed people we needed to find as many of the emails from that period of the hard drive crash as we could. We found and produced 24,000 Lois Lerner emails from the period of her hard drive crash. She did not destroy information thereafter. We produced another 50,000 emails. So the investigators, all six of them, had 78,000 Lois Lerner emails from the period of 2009 to 2013. Well, I would submit that you had a duty to inform Congress immediately when you learned that. But let me move on because I've only got no, no, a minute and I would have agree. To go. I, I have said that in retrospect, if I had it to do over again in April, I would have contacted and advise Congress immediately. Right. Uh, there was no, the delay didn't change any investigation, but I can understand the aggravation it caused in some areas. And if I had to do it again, I would actually advise the Congress that the hard drive, we, I knew the hard drive had crashed and had been advised of that. We were now going to try, as we did, to produce all the emails we could from that period, and we actually produced 24,000. Thank you. Let me move on. Similarly, after you learned of the destruction of Lois Lerner's emails, you testified that the IRS went to great lengths to try to resurrect her emails uh, by other means. Uh, this, too, turned out to be false. Uh, you and the IRS did very little to recover uh, those destroyed emails. In fact, experts testified that there were six ways the IRS could have tried to reacquire the emails. You failed to even try five of the six techniques. Uh, you failed to look at the IRS's own backup tapes. You failed to look at the server. You failed to look at the backup server. You failed to look at the loaner laptop. And you even failed to look at Lois Lerner's BlackBerry. Uh, so you really did very little to comply uh, with that. Uh, let me, my time's running out, so let me just say this. Um, what really makes me mad about this whole sorry episode uh, is that the IRS subpoenas information from taxpayers all the time. And if the average taxpayer exercised the same lack of cooperation that the IRS uh, displayed in this matter, that taxpayer would be in a world of trouble. That taxpayer would undoubtedly have been prosecuted, likely convicted, and likely would have spent time behind bars. But in this case, it was the Obama administration's powerful IRS that got caught with its hand in the cookie jar. And you circled the wagons, and clammed up, and you took the fifth, and you destroyed evidence, and betrayed the country. Uh, and most sadly, uh, got away with it. And my time's expired, so I yield back. Chair, thanks. The gentleman recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am really astonished by some of the reckless uh, statements that have been made uh, this morning. But let me just go to uh, the commissioner. You're under oath right now, right? You have to tell us the truth. Yes. And we've had a, an IG report basically uh, pointing out that when you testified before to a congressional committee, you told the truth as you knew it at the time, and later there was information that you didn't know that came out that you sent to us. Is that correct? Correct. So I guess my question, if you take a look at the Constitution, Article 2, Section 4, it says the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, I realize you're not uh, here as an expert on constitutional law, but you are a lawyer and you went to a very fine law school. Can you tell me which element of that, treason, bribery, or other high crime and misdemeanor that you've committed? Uh, 
My position and that of my lawyers is I have not committed any of those crimes. But again, I recognize <clears throat> this committee has already heard from constitutional experts, and it's this committee's decision. No, I understand that, but I just think this is a trumped-up type of thing. I just think it's having worked on uh, many impeachments in the past, this doesn't even pass the smell test. This is absurd. I would like to also ask, since you're here and we're not on the Financial Services Committee, is it within the authority of the uh, commissioner to suspend an audit of a taxpayer during the course of a presidential campaign so that that taxpayer who felt that they were constrained in the release of their audit would then be, feel okay to release it? <clears throat> the IRS uh, commissioner... IRS Commissioner has no authority over any individual audit or even the determination of whether an audit should begin, and I think that's appropriate. Let me ask you whether or not, I know that everything that the IRS does is private and, and that the uh, staff takes that very seriously, and I think we all appreciate that. But let me ask you this. If an audit had been terminated, would that would the commissioner or the agency be allowed to, to, to say publicly that there was, in fact, no audit going on of a taxpayer? Uh, we never would comp do comment about any taxpayer situation, the status of whether they're under audit, whether the audit's continuing, or whether it's concluded. That's all taxpayer information that's protected. So even if there was nothing going on, if somebody was lying about that, th they just get away with the lie? Uh, uh, we would never comment <clears throat> on a any taxpayer's uh, situation with regard to audits or filings or what was in that information. I'd like to talk about whether or not if someone took money from a foreign government, say Russia, and then decided as a, a candidate or an elected official to go easy on our opponent. Would that, if they were elected, an elected official, would that fall into the realm and the constitution of bribery or treason? I'm not in a position to uh, make a comment on that. Well, I just think that, you know, it, uh, one of the things that uh, should concern this committee is the fact that one of our uh, candidates for president has failed to provide transparency on his um, financial situation by releasing his tax returns as every other candidate has this time and has for many, many decades. It leads to questions on the role that Russia is playing in his business, uh, what that may lead him to do in terms of his extraordinary comments of praise for the Russian leader, who is a virtual dictator and certainly an adversary of the United States. And I would hope that this committee might uh, use some time to explore that possibility and to see if we couldn't uh, get that candidate to do the right thing and let the American people know that he isn't compromised financially uh, with uh, Russia and uh, the foreign power who is causing so much problems in, in the world, in the Balkans, in Syria, and certainly uh, elsewhere around the world. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. The time of the gentleman has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll refrain from asking about large uh, nonprofits that might have taken and been influenced by uh, foreign government contributions. That would be too sensitive to Mrs. Clinton. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner, uh, our founding fathers uh, did consider maladministration for impeachment, and they decided that that was too low. Do you know of that from your readings? That's my understanding. And so I want to ask very much along that. Misdemeanors are in, maladministration is out. Now, I represent Camp Pendleton and 47,000 Marines. Uh, maladministration is what you get fired for if you're a colonel, a captain, a sergeant, or even a general. 
Uh, and that includes loss of confidence in being able to do the job, failure to, to essentially get your subordinates to follow your orders, uh, failure to show the kind of uh, zealous obedience uh, for compliance with rules, regulations, and laws. These are two different standards, the standard between impeachment uh, and the standard for relieving a senior officer or even a sergeant in the military. So I want to go through this because I, I, I think at a minimum we should have a discussion about what actually occurred. Uh, you were under a subpoena. You were aware that we were looking for documents. You assured the Oversight Committee that you were using absolutely every possible tool to recover them. And uh, so now the question, in retrospect, did you fail to use every tool? Did you fail to ask the kinds of questions of enough people, enough experts, to know that the BlackBerry that was still existed at the time of the investigation would have had many of these lost emails, that the servers, the tapes, and other uh, documents uh, could have been recovered as you eventually discovered? Would you say that that is a failure of yours that you will have to live with? Uh, no, we clearly failed. Uh, the BlackBerry was actually in the control of the IG from uh, 2013 on. But as I've said, <clears throat> we clearly uh, failed in areas of uh, preservation of documents, and I've said that was a mistake, and it was driven by the fact that we were spending, and I was told the group were looking every place they thought they would find the email. We found 1,300,000 pages of documents that were produced. It took us a year to do that. Uh, and that was where people thought the most likely places was to come. The IG and his review of everything else found another thousand emails, a number of which were in the early 2000s, long before this held. But those thousand emails, uh, if we'd had the technique and the time, would have been important to produce. But I m would remind you that uh, we did produce a phenomenal volume of stuff with 250 people working every day. And from my standpoint, my commitment and, and order and instruction to people was to do everything possible to produce information for the committee as fast as we could and as thoroughly as we could. Thank you. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that the 226-page report chron chronicling the actions be placed in the record from the Oversight Committee. Without objection, they will be Thank made you. a part of the record. Commissioner, uh, you know, obviously, uh, if we had to do this over again, we would all ask that it be done differently. But I'm going to use the remainder of my time to ask you a more serious question. In light of the fact that agency heads uh, generally make the decisions about subpoenas coming from Congress, and they lack, as you lack, in spite of all your experience, the expertise to know where to go, how to preserve documents, where the uh, uh, the, uh, if you will, all the places to make sure the six different areas that could have been looked at and according to the uh, IG were not looked at, five of them. Do you think that Congress should insist on having a contact and responsible person in each agency that in fact could be held accountable because they had the expertise and could be reasonably expected to have the authority to enforce and deliver documents on behalf of lawfully submitted subpoenas? <clears throat> That's an interesting suggestion that I don't have the authority to respond to, but it would be helpful uh, to re uh, reaffirm uh, the commitment that we had at the IRS, which is if Congress asks, not whether subpoena or not, if Congress asks for information, we have an obligation to provide it as quickly as we can, as thoroughly as we can. And that's an obligation, uh, as I say, it doesn't take a subpoena. That's an obligation we have to the Congress any time you ask us for a question. In my last few seconds, uh, Lois Lerner was referred for a criminal indictment by the Ways and Means Committee under uh, a statute that said that the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia shall present to a grand jury, and the administration failed to do that. In retrospect, when the American people expect somebody to be held accountable for the wrongful targeting of conservative groups, wouldn't it have gone a long way if the Justice Department had simply complied with the law rather than, uh, than chose not to comply with the law? I can't speak for the Justice Department, but I can, as you know, remind you that the, from the commissioner on down, the acting commissioner on down, uh, all five levels of people responsible in this area are no longer with the government. They're no longer with the IRS. They, in fact, <clears throat> no longer have their jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks. The gentleman recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Let me thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and let me apologize for your presence here today. I realize that you have made a commitment as a public servant 
but I think it's appropriate to apologize to you uh, for uh, what I believe is a uh, non-serious effort as relates to the Constitution and the impeachment criteria. Saying that, let me take note of your language in your statement, which says, I will do my best today to answer your questions, and I'm committed to full cooperation. That means listening and responding to feedback and criticism, acknowledging mistakes, and working diligently to improve. Do you still adhere to that statement I, in your testimony? I do. So you're committed as a public servant to ensure that we get all the information that we need to have. Is that not correct? <laughs> that is correct. I spent uh, four years on the Senate side as the Chief of Staff to a Senator who ultimately chaired the Oversight Committee in the Senate, and I fully understand and appreciate and think it's appropriate <clears throat> for agencies to respond as quickly as they can with all of the information requested. Thank you, Commissioner, very much. Let me put into the record a statement the Senate Finance Committee, Department of Justice, and the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration found three points related to you, Commissioner. And that is that you had not misled Congress, you had not allowed evidence to be destroyed, at least it was not attributable to you, and uh, you were not considered to have obstructed oversight of the IRS. Do you still believe that those were true about your actions as a commissioner? I do. Uh, let me also put into the record a letter dated September 14th where a direct question was asked to the Treasury Inspector General uh, no evidence was uncovered that any IRS employees have been directed to destroy or hide information from Congress, the DOJ, or the TIGTA. That letter was written by two members of Congress on September 14, 2016. A letter came back from uh, Mr. Russell, J. Russell George, Inspector General, uh, and I quote, um, it says, and its conclusion, I received your letter, and its conclusion that no evidence was uncovered that any IRS employees have been directed to destroy or hide information from Congress or DOJ or TIGTA. Uh, in your letter, you specifically asked, since issuing this report, has your office changed its previous conclusion on this matter? At this time, no additional information has been uncovered that changes our conclusion in this report. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to put this in the record. Um, Commissioner that letter from the Inspector General? objection, Gen the document will be made a part of the record. You have seen uh, such reports from the Inspector General, have you not? Yes. And do you adhere uh, or at least understand that that is being said about IRS employees, which would include yourself? Yes. Right. Uh, do you, uh, was Ms. Lerner at the IRS uh, when you arrived? No, she was gone. I've never actually met her or talked to her. Are you still engaging in be on the lookout activities? Uh, we have not used <clears throat> the on-the-lookout activity uh, numbers for uh, three years or longer. I think it's also important to note, again, that this is not an impeachment hearing, and even though many of our members are inquiring in that manner, it is not. Uh, and it also is important to note that experts have said that we have not given you due process. I hope as we proceed to eliminate uh, this proceeding, meaning to cease and desist, uh, that if we do not, that you'll have due process. Let me proceed with some uh, questions regarding uh, the time that you've come after February 2014. What efforts have you made to be constructive and to provide information uh, to members of Congress? Uh, across the board, I've made a commitment that uh, we will respond to every request. I will personally respond to every letter within 30 days, if at all possible, and I will explain, if not, as a general matter, over 90 percent of inquiries from me within 90 days. Uh, we have not uh, uh, refused to provide any information. We are uh, uh, anxious across the board. The IRS is, uh, affects every taxpayer uh, okay. in the country. Commissioner, it's important in this for us to be transparent. Thank you. And in this proceeding dealing with impeachment, if it's not high crimes and misdemeanor, there are elements that our friends uh, believe uh, that would suggest that you would uh, be subjected to impeachment proceedings. Um, and so is there anything that you've done that can show deliberate bad faith? You're a lawyer. You're allowed to uh, say that uh, uh, you think this action or that action. Is there any action that may have, been, have done so? As I've said, we had, it was not a perfect process. Uh, there are things that, again, in retrospect... When you made mistakes, you owned up to it. Is that correct? Met. And And basically there's nothing... Uh, that I feel, uh, has, and no evidence that I have actually acted in bad faith, given anybody instruction. And you've offered comply. information when you found the information after the fact. And when we found the information. In fact, we spent a lot of time, again, I should have told L Congress earlier, let me ask but we you spent this. time finding the 24,000. Let me ask emails. you this, Commission. I'm sorry for talking over you. I'm just trying to get in. Uh, is it appropriate for a um, uh, foundation to give uh, political donations out of the, uh, out of the foundation, a 501c3 uh, foundation? Uh, 
501c3 uh, uh, organizations, foundations, otherwise, are not allowed to participate in politics. I thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and uh, I believe an apology is owed to you, and I believe that there are no grounds, if we were to move in that direction, for any form of impeachment. We need to thank you for your service. Continue to do the good work that you're doing, working on behalf of the American people, and answering questions from Congress in the normal oversight responsibilities. Thank you, and I yield back. The time of the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes, for five minutes. Chairman, thank you. And Commissioner, thank you for being here. As we sit here today, just bringing a little common sense to this, a vast uh, majority of Americans believe today that our country is headed in the wrong direction, and they want us, the people elected by them, just to fix it. And I want to go on record as saying I don't apologize for trying to fix it. And when I look here and I recognize that a vast majority of Americans no longer trust their government, that creates a crisis of confidence in our government, and they have a good reason to believe that. And I don't apologize for asking how we fix that. When I see gag orders issued by the Pentagon where they don't even allow uh, individuals over there to testify or meet with members of Congress, we see evidence that's being destroyed, we see misrepresentation of facts to Congress, that's something we should come together and try to fix. And so everybody's asked you what's appropriate testimony from the other side. So I want to ask you this. What do you feel is appropriate as the IRS commissioner? Should you be held to a lower standard than the taxpayer subject to your jurisdiction, a higher standard, or the same standard? <clears throat> what do you think is appropriate for us to hold you to? I, I think I, like any public servant, uh, should be held to the highest standards of probity, uh, we should uh, cooperate. Should you be held with, to at least the, an equal standard to uh, taxpayers that are subject to your jurisdiction? Yes, we, I, I think we should be uh, uh, held to that standard and or if, even higher. And if that's the case, wouldn't you agree that if a taxpayer were sitting where you were sitting with the same responses that you are given, that that taxpayer would be in a lot of trouble before the Internal Revenue Service? And let me just throw this out to you. If the facts show that you lied to Congress, I'm not saying they did, if they show that you lied to Congress or that you mismanaged your office, um, should, uh, what do you believe is appropriate for Congress to do to try to fix it? You've already said you don't think that impeachment is the right thing. What do you think is appropriate? Should we just do nothing and let that continue? Or do we just keep coming back in here and saying, oh, we're not going to do it again? Uh, no, I think uh, I've, I've never objected to any of the hearings. I've had over four. I'm not uh, talking about the hearings. hearings. I'm talking about the conclusions from the hearings. Conclusions. What do you th you you said uh, that you didn't think impeachment was inappropriate? Mr. Jordan said he didn't think you should continue to hold that office. If a taxpayer were here, you said you should be held to the same right. standards as that taxpayer. And if a that taxpayer, taxpayer would have been uh, had to pay the IRS. Uh, if the taxpayer provided us information truthfully, did the best they could to produce information, and found that information was missing. The first thing we do with that taxpayer is try to help them reconstruct those records. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not going to tell me that if a taxpayer comes to you and has filed a faulty tax return and then just says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was the case, that you're going to let him off the hook? No, he's got to pay the taxes he owes. The question is whether... What do you owe for misrepresenting something to Congress? And let me just say this to you, Mr. Commissioner. What incentive is it when you come here to testify before us, if you can consistently just say, I don't know, isn't it a great incentive for you not to do due diligence to find out? You could have told the committee, I don't know, but when you make an affirmative statement, doesn't that put you under some responsibility to have made sure you've ascertained that? And the second thing, my friends on the other side of the aisle consistently love to say they didn't find any affirmative action that you did to order that that um, information would be impeded from going to Congress. Don't you have an affirmative duty to do everything you can to make sure that doesn't take place? I have a duty to make sure the agency functions well, that that doesn't take place to the extent I can control In hindsight, it. did you do everything you could do to find out if uh, you were making accurate statements before Congress? And did you do everything you could do to make sure that evidence getting to Congress wasn't being impeded? Uh, I do in retrospect. The erasure of those tapes was not known until well after my hearings. That's not uh, my and if, question. My well, question the answer is, is I couldn't tell the committee things I didn't know. All I could tell the committee in honesty and good faith 
was what I knew. And what I knew is what I told the committee. When later information, a year later in terms of the tapes did came you, out, I said that was a mistake and we should be Did you do everything within your power to find that information? You said you were given assurances. You know, is that what you just relied on, that one person told you that? I uh, know. Uh, we have a large number of executives that I have great confidence in. And when they tell me that, in fact, they're doing their best to produce all of the relevant so evidence. So you just can rely on those experts to tell you that, and that's enough for you. And I just close by saying, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the Commissioner says he should be the same standard of the taxpayer. If a taxpayer was sitting there, uh, Mr. Commissioner, I think you know he'd be in a world of hurt. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks. The gentleman recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, firstly, I welcome you. Uh, I know you'd rather be other places, and I probably <laughs> wish you were other places too. But you're here. And this has all the trappings of impeachment, and that's a kind of a sexy thing, so to speak, in political parlance. But the constitutional standard for impeachment that this committee considers is high crimes or misdemeanors, and I know that's been discussed today. The question is not whether you, Commissioner, have been a perfect administrator, and I'm not saying you haven't. Uh, that's a question for the Ways and Means Committee to decide. They oversee the IRS and for the president who appointed you, not for this committee. The question we're called upon in this context to decide whether there have been high crimes or misdemeanors that warrant the extraordinary constitutional remedy of impeachment. And that would be high crimes or misdemeanors that you have committed, not that maybe people think your office or your predecessors committed. Uh, we heard in our last hearing that although high crimes and misdemeanors need not be limited to criminal acts, the commissioner's critics still need to show that he acted with some deliberate bad faith. They have not done so, and every other investigator has looked at these facts. The Treasury, Inspector General, the Department of Justice, and the Senate Finance Committee have reached the same conclusion. So it's regretful that you're here, but since you're here, I want to ask you this. Has the Internal Revenue Service been funded adequately to perform its job of catching tax cheats and by tacking, catching tax cheats and or the threat thereof gotten the revenues that are necessary to provide the services that government should be rendering? No. How much has the IRS budget been cut recently? The IRS budget since 2010 has been cut $900 million, even as we have 10 million more taxpayers and a wide range of statutory mandates to implement. And by being cut $900 million? Is that what you said? Yes, $900 million over, uh, our budget today is $900 million less than it was six years ago. Is, is, has anybody taken that figure and said that when you cut the IRS $900 million, how much revenue is lost because of the lack of ability to audit? Uh, we, est we estimate and have provided that information to uh, Congress that we are leaving $5 billion a year on the table. And it's not a guess as to we might find people that's $5 billion in audits that we can't uh, undertake when we know there are difficulties. So we cut $900 million. We haven't saved $900 million. We've lost $4 billion, $100 million? Correct. Does that contribute to the deficit? Yes. And if you cut IRS by that much money, and y'all are kind of the whipping boy of the, my friends on the other side of the aisle who don't like or think that government services are so necessary, the government has to fund entitlements, quote unquote. So if you don't have the money and we lose $4 billion, $100 million, we're hurting the person at the bottom. People that need government assistance is not an entitlement, whether it's be stamp payments, or it's energy, LIHEAP, uh, folks not getting through the winters without freezing, or not getting enough food for their children, or public schools, or maybe even public health, the CDC and the NIH, which is looking for cures for cancer and Alzheimer's and diabetes and heart disease and stroke and all the other diseases that are going to come and get each and every one of us uh, one day. Those folks are getting hurt when they attack you they are attacking the NIH, they are attacking the CDC, they are attacking people who need 
SNAP payments for ease hunger and their children and WIC payments and public education and public health. Is that not true? Uh, well, I'm not an expert where the money would go, but clearly there's less money uh, to be provided or appropriated or to cut the deficit. Well, it's just incredulous to me. You've done nothing to warrant this hearing. But your office is under attack because government is under attack, and the government that's under attack is the government takes care of the poorest and the least of these, those that are be the most precious in the eyes of people who look at humanity as a, at a sight of seeing how we treat others, and if we treat others as we should treat, treat ourselves and could follow the golden rule. And that's unfortunate. And with that, I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Commissioner. I, I thank you for uh, coming here to testify. I think this important discussion this country is having right now about our reliability within our government agencies. And um, the first question from me would be: um, um, Did Lois Lerner have? any kind of a software package or any kind of electronic search that excluded or identified the conservative groups that far outweighed the non-conservative groups that had asked for the not-for-profit status? Yes, uh, clearly all of this started with the IG report noting that uh, imp he called it improper criteria. They were totally improper criteria were used to select organizations applying for C4 designation for further review. Those organizations predominantly were conservative organizations. Were there, was it an electronic system that, that, that sorted out these applications? Was uh, there no. any database, any matrix of any kind, any paperwork of any kind other than a stack of applications? Uh, now, my understanding is that there were ultimately developed beyond the lookout list for organizations with these names in their titles. Uh, and some of those were progressive names, but the bulk of the applications were conservative. And it was that list, that beyond the lookout list of any organization with these names in their title, had nothing to do with whatever their political philosophies or views were. It was if their name was in the title, and who they should then be selected for review. Beyond the lookout. Pardon? Who generated that beyond the lookout memo? Uh, it actually was, I, I'm not an expert in uh, what happened before I got there, but my understanding was it was a back and forth by. Uh, 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 people at uh, the Lois from the office as well as the front line trying to figure out how do we handle these and that list was developed and there was an attempt to stop using the list and then the list got used again. And we know that the IG uh, confirmed the targeting that had taken place as well. I'd, I'd ask you, have there been any have there been any firings, dismissals? Have you identified anyone within the IRS that had uh, violated law or policy or protocol in such a way that it was worthy of termination? Uh, as I noted, all of this happened well before I got there is why I'm here. But as I stated, uh, starting with the acting commissioner down, uh, everyone in that chain of command is gone. Everybody in the chain of command is gone. Are there, were there any remaining culprits within the IRS today? Uh, none that anybody has pointed out that had a responsibility. The leadership and the responsibility are gone. And if you, had, and if you identified them, that would be your duty going forward as well? Yes. And uh, then I'd like to take you to Martinsburg and having a little trouble understanding that. And uh, that is there were 424 tapes that were discovered at storage in Martinsburg in a, in a, a, a shipping center that I view, view as a warehouse of about 1,900 square feet. I know about how big that is. And uh, so that night shift they decided they would scrub those tapes, the 422 of the 424 successfully. And can you explain to this committee how long it would take to process 422 tapes? Uh, I don't know, but I assume it's a relatively prompt process. I would note uh, the tapes actually had been sent to Martinsburg. They originally were in New Carrollton, and they were actually <clears throat> a bulk of related tapes had been uh, dis uh, erased uh, a couple of years before that. These were the remaining tapes. Uh, they were in a closet. The IG said they were identified as junk, and they were sent. <laughs> Do they, do they process them one tape at a time or multiple tapes in batches? Uh, that I don't understand. I don't know, but I think well, they're one at a time. I but think we that's, will, we I can think find that's out. important because how long would it take you to put a tape in, scrub it, even if it's a couple of minutes to do so, and another and another, and to get 422 of them done in an eight-hour night shift? Uh, do you know the names of the individuals that process those tapes? Uh, I do. And uh, they're still working for the IRS? Uh, I, I can't talk about personnel, but the IG investigated them, uh, clearly provided a report, and I can't say anything more yeah, about But I'm not personnel. asking you for their names. I'm just saying, are they still working for the IRS? 
Uh, my understanding is at least one of them is. And, but the IG noted it was an honest mistake, and we turned it over to our people to review it, uh, and that personal review, per, personnel review went on. But the IG said they had made an honest mistake. It was not anything intentional on their part. They certainly didn't mean to interfere with anything going on. The, the IG time. and their testimony before Congress seemed to be a bit incredulous that this string of, this string of coincidences could be put together in that fashion and uh, have the voids and the vacancies of information that we have. Um, I just reflect on this, uh, Commissioner, is that if I would take the timeline of the IRS activities throughout this thing, and there are many of them sitting around in this committee today, and I'd overlay that over the timeline of the things that went on with Watergate, which one, I'll ask you, which one do you think would sound more improbable? Uh, again, that's a judgment I guess people could make. I think when there's a 17-minute gap and no intervening information provided, that's more significant than when there are tapes erased and 24,000 emails are provided from that same period. If we had some information about that conversation on the 17-minute gap, they'd be more comparable. But there was no information there. It was all lost here. The, IRA, uh, the IG said 24,000 emails, but only 10,000 of them were from the gap period. And in that gap period, we produced 24,000, twice as many emails from uh, the last learner. I would submit the opposite conclusion myself, but I thank you, Commissioner, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman has expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman. This uh, hearing has been noticed as a hearing on impeachment articles referred on John Koshkin in Part 3. There are no impeachment articles, and this is not an impeachment hearing. This hearing is therefore simply a total sham. The impeachment process cannot begin until the 435 members of the House of Representatives adopt a resolution authorizing the House Judiciary Committee to conduct an independent investigation. Such a resolution has not been presented to or passed by the House, rendering, rendering today's hearing a misnamed farce. This committee does a grave injustice to the committee as a hollowed institution by being complicit in the perpetuation of this sham proceeding. There is a reason for a careful process when it comes to the most drastic action of impeachment. It's called due process. The effort to impeach IRS, IRS Commissioner John Koshkinen is without precedent in the history of the United States. The House has impeached executive branch officials only three times, and it has never impeached a sub-cabinet official. The so-called impeachment resolutions contain clear errors of fact, misleading statements, and baseless conclusions. The Commissioner has repeatedly asked for immediate access to the transcripts of all interviews conducted by the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee during its investigation. They are necessary to answer basic questions about the scope and depth of that committee's investigation, such as what witnesses were interviewed, what questions were asked, what leads were followed, and whether all, ever, all relevant information was disclosed. But again, I would tell you that this committee has conducted no such investigation, the House Judiciary Committee. This is a drastic departure from our previous process, and it's depriving Commissioner Koshkinen of his due process rights. You know, there are many basic uh, reasons for uh, there to be due process applicable to this particular proceeding with, with the errors that are and the misleading statements and baseless conclusions uh, that riddle the so-called charging document. Um, it's due process that requires Commissioner Koshkinen to be allowed to make objections to any evidence, to cross-examine each witness that the resolution's proponents put forward, to call his own witnesses to expose what 
he believes to be, to be blatant factual errors in the resolution. And then after due process allowed for the submission of the evidence against him and his ability to confront that evidence, present his own evidence, have that evidence subject to confrontation by the accuser, it then would fall to the reasoned and sober intellect of this committee to determine whether or not impeachment was in fact warranted, which is a very drastic action. Again, only taking place three times in the history of this country. So what we're doing today, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I know, the American people know, it's just playing politics. We've got other things that we should be dealing with. The Zika virus, funding for it, funding for the Flint fiasco that has been unremediated for the last year. So many things for this Congress to do. Passing a budget, uh, keeping the government open. We're approaching another deadline, September 30th. No continuing resolution, no omnibus, no appropriations bills passed, nothing. And here we are three or four days before we adjourn so that these members who talk so badly about the institution of government can go home to get reelected so they can come back next year and do nothing. With that, I will uh, uh, yield back the balance of my time. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, sometimes the, the track record uh, of a particular witness to, to obfuscate is so strong that it vitiates the purpose uh, of additional questions. And all that one can do uh, is to state the facts and hope that they will be enough to serve the cause of justice. Uh, Commissioner John Koskinen took over the Internal Revenue Service in the wake of the IRS conservative group targeting scandal, ostensibly for the precise purpose of reforming that agency internally. Instead, he pointedly continued his predecessor's legacy of deliberately stonewalling justice. Uh, after Lois Lerner, uh, director of the IRS's uh, tax-exempt organizations unit, invoked the Fifth Amendment when she appeared before Congress, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform issued a subpoena for IRS documents, including all of Lois Lerner's emails. The IRS's chief technology officer specifically issued a preservation order instructing employees not to destroy any emails, backup tapes, or anything relevant to the investigation. But Mr. Chairman, despite a congressional subpoena and a do not destroy order, the IRS Inspector General found that the agency erased 422 backup tapes containing as many as 24,000 emails. Now, I know that's been stated here, but all the while, Commissioner Koskinen uh, knowingly kept Congress in the dark. Commissioner Koskinen was clearly aware that the emails had been lost, but he knowingly and deliberately withheld that information for, from Congress for four months and stonewalled the entire investigation. Mr. Koskinen testified under oath four different times before Congress during that four-month period, saying he would turn over all of Lerner's emails, making no mention of the fact that the bulk of them had already been, quote, lost. Mr. Koskinen provided false testimony and swore under oath that the information on the bulk of the backup tapes was unrecoverable. The Inspector General found that approximately 700 of those emails had not in fact been erased and were in fact recoverable. Commissioner Koskinen then failed to protect citizens against the same type of future discrimination. A General Accounting Office report found no significant measures had been implemented under Mr. Koskinen's watch to ensure that civil servants at the IRS don't continue in the future to unlawfully target Americans based on their political or religious views. Mr. Chairman, this entire matter was absolutely counter to everything a republic like ours was meant to be. In a constitutional republic like the United States of America, we are fundamentally predicated on the rule of law. And there are very few things that more shamefully break faith with America and the American people or that undermine their trust in their government more than witnessing those 
given the sacred responsibility to enforce taxation equally and according to the law, using the federal government's power of taxation and its attending power to unlawfully uh, and economically destroy. For them to then de deliberately oppress American citizens based on their religious or political views with these powers is an unconscionable act. Uh, and such a tyrannical abuse of power and the betrayal of their sworn oath to the United States Constitution uh, by Mr. Koskinen and Mr. Obama will be writ large in their legacy because it is something that goes to the very heart of the rule of law in this republic and that so many lying out in Arlington National Cemetery died to preserve. Mr. Koskinen would never have allowed an American taxpayer to treat an IRS audit the way he and other IRS officials have treated this congressional investigation. The Congress owes it to the American people and future generations, and to our sworn oath to the Constitution to hold the perpetrators of this tyrannical abuse of power accountable and to make sure it never happens again. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Chair thanks the gentleman and recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Koskinen, uh, since you are the Commissioner of the IRS, I have some tax questions for you. Since 1976, Commissioner, every Democratic and Republican candidate for president, every one, has released his personal tax returns. And releasing tax returns provides voters with important background information on the candidate's contributions to his community, how he may operate his business. And I just would like to confirm a few things that we might know if we had access to uh, the candidate's tax returns. Um, releasing a, a tax return can demonstrate how much a person pays in taxes. Is that correct? You would know any time to anybody filed what they paid in taxes, yes. And, and would it also tell us how much a person gives to charity? Uh, to the extent they took the charitable deduction, it would, uh, for various reasons, sometimes people don't. Um, would it give us some indication into uh, a person's assets or uh, investments? Would, uh, Harder, all you report is income and expenses, so uh, it would not necessarily tell you a lot about assets other than that they produced a lot of income. If they produced a lot of income, we can get, draw some conclusions about the, the amount of the assets. Right, but there would be no way to actually know what the assets yeah, are. And, and it, would it confirm how the person has chosen to try to reduce his tax liability? Yeah, you would be able to see in any taxpayer's return what the deductions were, what uh, uh, benefits they took advantage of. Right. If we had a tax, uh, the tax return, would it provide information on, on how a person receives his income, right? Uh, you would see the, uh, the source of income, yes. Right. And we may, if we had the access to the tax returns, have some indication how the person finances uh, his, uh, his real estate transactions. We would have some. You wouldn't have a full picture again because you wouldn't have a picture of all we'd the assets. We'd have some. Right. We'd have some as opposed to none. Um, is it, and is it correct that a lot of this information we would be able to glean right from the first couple of pages of a person's 1040 and Schedule A? Uh, you would have some, but it would be a very high level of abstraction because there would not be any of the exhibits. Right. But if, well, let me just, let me go on. Um, as you're aware, the, the current Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, has repeatedly said that he's unable to release his tax returns because he's under audit by the IRS. He said, when the audit is complete, I will release my returns. I don't have a problem with it. It doesn't matter. So I just have a few questions about that. Under current law, the, um, uh, the IRS is prohibited from disclosing a person's tax returns, right? Correct. Uh, but current law doesn't prevent a person from releasing his own tax returns. That's correct. And how long can an audit go on? Audits can go on uh, depending on the complexity for years. And a person's not prohibited from releasing their tax returns while they're under audit, are they? Uh, no, they may be advised not to, but they're not prohibited. Advised by the IRS not to? Uh, they may be advised by their uh, advisors, but not by the IRS. Okay. And in fact, Richard Nixon released his tax returns while he was being audited by the IRS. Is there anything in the law that prohibits a person from releasing his tax returns during an audit? No. Uh, does the IRS, well, let me ask another question, would releasing the person's tax return during the audit in any way impact that pending audit of the return? The release itself wouldn't. Uh, the concern sometimes by taxpayers is that when the information is public, there may be more information that will be uh, yes. discovered or provided, that but is, that is the release concern. itself I understand. Uh, I understand. Not. Right. We understand. That's the concern. Uh, does the IRS send a letter to a person informing him that he's being audited by the IRS? 
Yes. In other and, words, uh, in fact, as I tell people with the phone scams, if you're surprised to be hearing from us, you're not hearing from us. We send you a letter if we're going to right, start. Commissioner Koskinen, is there any law or regulation that prevents a person from publicly disclosing the letter from the IRS that tells them that they are being audited? Uh, there's no restriction by the IRS. Um, releasing tax returns, as we've just been discussing, provides transparency. Um, it's uh, being reported also on the front page of today's Washington Post that uh, the Trump